We're back on the road this April with our live show, Cocaine Cowboys. If you want to hear the story of Ireland's love affair with Colombian powder and those who made millions in the gold rush, join us in Galway's Town Hall Theatre on Saturday 6th of April, Killarney's INEC on Saturday the 13th of April. Tickets for Belfast's show have sold out on Ticketmaster.ie, but limited availability remains at ulsterhall.co.uk. That's ulsterhall.co.uk. So James Mago Gately once sold sweets in a shop, he says, and earned his money uh, through other means, including his partner's beauty company. And he did certainly own a little news agent or something around the back of this building. It wasn't in the North far away. City. Yeah, yeah. just on the corner there. Yeah, wasn't wasn't that far away at all? And he was a he barber to- as well. Toilet rolls, I remember in it actually, because they were always packed up outside the front of it. Yeah, don't recall that now exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was on my way home, all right. Yeah, so all of that, but in what is pretty sensational evidence, read to the court as part of the Criminal Assets Bureau grounding affidavit for their case against him. It has been said, and like this is no surprise to you or I, but you know we we've always known the sort of some of the details that have come up, but we were in no way uh, able to speak about them because they hadn't been put before the courts. Yeah, I, I suppose that this is what comes out in a lot of these cab cases is, you, you know, you have the criminal background of the respondents are kind of outlined to the court as part of the, the Criminal Assets Bureau Bureau's case to show that all their expenditure or the proceeds that they have or whatever assets they have, have come from crime. Um, and so one of the strands of their cases is always linking the people who are the respondents in the cases, they call it. And in this one, it's James Mago Gately and his partner, Charlene Lamb. And it's to show their links to criminality. Now, to be fair to Charlene, her main link to criminality is her partner, James Mago Gately. She has no she has no criminal convictions at all. It just was mentioned. Motoring offences. It's just three motoring offences. That's it. Like, you know, mobile phone in hand, parking at a bus stop, I think. So, you know, it's absolutely nothing in, in regards to that. But I mean, in, in terms of Mago Gately, he was described, I mean, straight off, they said he was originally, uh, you know, a, you know, a senior senior figure in the Kinahan organized crime group. And then with the, the murder of Gary Hutch, his pal in, in Spain in December, I think, wasn't it December 2015? 2014. 2014, sorry, there you go. Uh, wait, no. September 2015, yeah. 2015. Um, and he was, of course, a pallbearer at, at, at his funeral. That was a picture I, I know that we used. Uh, and, and that was used as as kind of in, in, the, in the case uh, this week that, you know, that he, he's, he's very much um, sided with the Kinahan, or sorry, he sided against the Kinahan faction with the Hutches in that, you know, horrific feud that broke out. Um, in, you know, subsequently to all that, you had the Regency shooting. Um, shortly afterwards, like within a, a couple of weeks of, of, well, a couple of months, certainly of, of Gary Hutch's murder in Spain. Um, and, you know, and it, it also went through, you know, um, the, you know, he'd been linked, uh, he'd been linked to a number of murders. Um, and, and one of them would have been the, the 2010 or 2011 murder of Eamon, the Don Dunn. And also uh, they linked him to the Regency shooting uh, in, mm. in which uh, David Byrne was shot dead. And I know that to some extent that had been out already in the media, but it was more in the kind of, it would have been phrased in a way that the the Byrne gang would have blamed him for mm. that mm. rather than any kind of definite evidence or anything. Whereas this is now belief evidence that's been given by senior Gardaí to say that they believe he was, he was linked to that. And from uh, recollection during the Regency trial, and I mean, we this was a lot of it coming out during Jonathan Dowdall's evidence, uh, which wasn't believed by the judges and wasn't taken on board by the court. But nonetheless, it kind of came into the public ether. A lot of people that were... Uh, certainly the doubt I was saying was linked to those murders. I think Mago Gately was one of those that was named because I remember afterwards we were able to sit down and kind of go through each one of the the people that had been named or given a shout out during the Regency trial and he was one of them. But whatever about the Byrne murder, because of course, look, that was carried out by the Hutch Organised Crime Group. That has been certainly given in evidence in court. But the aim of the Don Dunn murder like of 2010, and he was shot in the Fossa House pub in Finglas. That was quite a skilled assassination, we could call it. He was, you know, 
out of control, Eamon the Don Dunn. He'd taken over um, a vast drugs organisation after the murder of his own boss, Marlow Highland, in 2007. He had sort of really um, punched his way to the top of the gangland ladder and had been responsible for, there was figures given out about up to 20 murders himself for directing murders. He became very paranoid yeah, and, user of drugs and, a, and num- a number of those um, victims were actually people that he had carry out murders himself. So, like you know, he he was anyone who did any dirty work for him were being targeted. So, In case they you know, told so, on him, or well, presumably so, yeah. so that they could. There, there's no prospect that these people could ever become state witnesses against him. So, I mean, that's getting to a point where nobody really wants to work with you. Know, in that mm. case, like if you're if you're getting involved in crime, like okay, he's killing maybe killers. But at what point is he going to turn on other people further down the road if he had developed that level of paranoia? Apparently very much like Marlowe Highland himself had yeah. had, had become. Um, and and he was moving around. He wasn't sleeping in the same place at night. He was living in caravan sites up on the, the northeast coast. And, you know, he was behaving very, very peculiarly. He had a, a lawyer who I think has since passed away who was acting on his behalf and he was suing everybody and... Yeah. yeah, no, it was kind of strange and and it was um, it was kind of a multi-gang effort. So, I mean, mm. while the Hutch faction, you know, individuals may have been involved and Maggo Gately being linked to it by the guards doesn't necessarily mean he was anywhere near the actual killing because, you know, there would have been a lot of moving parts between spotting him, supplying mm-hmm. a weapon, supplying cars, you know, helping people get away, paying off whoever needs to be paid off, all that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's, there's so many different ways somebody could have could be linked to it. Of course, you know, it, it was pointed out by his own defence team. Uh, I mean, they put up a, a bit of a fight, I suppose, and they were mentioning, well, look, you know, he hasn't really been convicted of anything serious. His last conviction was in 2007. He's 34 convictions, 19 of which were for road traffic, mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Um it, again, you know, of course, on, on the Criminal Assets Bureau side, it was mentioned that uh, he was involved in a, a, a robbery at Bayside, I think in 2008, in which a large sum of cash was taken. And that he was also arrested over um, a Tiger robbery in which over 700,000 uh, euro or pounds, euro was taken in, in 2009. So like, again, there was making the point there, his side were making the point that, okay, he was arrested, but he wasn't certainly not convicted in, in any of these things. It's funny now, because Gary Hutch would have been suspected of being involved in a tiger uh, kidnap and robbery around yeah, the and, same time. And, and in fairness, that's how the Cab Council, that's how they described the, the Hutch gang. I mean, the, the initial thing was that they're an organized crime group involved in armed robbery, as well yeah. as the importation and distribution of drugs. So I mean, armed robbery was part and parcel of, I suppose, one of their income streams to use the proper business parlance, you know, um, along with drugs. Um, But also interesting enough, the fact that there was um, attempts on his life was also highlighted as the fact, well, you got to be involved in organized crime if someone's trying to kill you in this fashion. And of course, uh, Imre Arrakis got a a great mention there. Um, uh, um, You know, the Estonian hitman who was hired by, allegedly by Daniel Kennan to come and try and, and, and kill Gately, who at the time was living in, in Newry. Um, which also came up um, in, in, in an affidavit that he had had put back into court in his defence that um, he had no money when they were looking for the legal aid. And when he was living in Newry, he was just working. He was valeting cars and working for accommodation and food, mm. which kind of, uh, I, I think, kind of is in contrast to the April expenditure. 10, 2017, when Imre Arrakis was sent to Ireland, uh, allegedly by Daniel Kinnahan, and he was caught due to a kind of a multi-agency investigation into him based in Lithuania and they were watching his movements had tipped off the Irish police who managed to get an operative out to the airport and followed him. Um, And of course, when he was arrested, he was found in possession of one of these encrypted phones. Uh, Messages on the phones were photographed before they disappeared. And that was all around the time that Daniel Kinahan was planning his wedding out in the Burj Al Arab to to Kiva Robinson and still managed to find time out to organise an attempted hit on on Gately. But just a month later, after that, and and that was a point. Another go, yeah, and that was a point made in 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 court. Like they they suggested that it was a demonstration of his prominent role in the Hutch organised crime gang. Mm. That within a month they were having a second go. 
um, at which he was lucky to escape. I think four bullets hit him. Like Where, he was out Caelan in the north side was of the garage. Uh, yeah, he was, he was at, a, I think, a Topaz garage at the time. Out at the airport, was uh, it? Close, yeah, close to the airport there. Um, geez, I could drive there, but I can't tell you the yeah. address. <laughs> oh, I know it. I know it. Yeah, it's um, on the way out to and Kulak. He, he, he's, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, yeah, it's not too far. Like, it'd be kind of, yeah, mm-hmm. turn left at Kulak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know airport. me in the north side. I'm not great. But yeah, um, and and so, but again, that was that was highlighted as look, this guy is a serious member of the opposing faction because the Kinnans made such an effort to try and kill him. Um, it was also mentioned that he he was linked. There was another shooting that he was linked to, in which uh, an, another member of the Hutch family was was shot. Um, uh, and, and this this was kind of mentioned in in court yesterday. You know, this is kind of like a barrister speed was reading. Was that described the as a kind of like a shooting that was part of you know? something to do with police and a robbery or was it described as a kind of an in-house It wasn't gang? described at all. It was it was literally uh, <coughs> as I, I think it just said there it was it was, it was a, a, a council speed reading his way through selected bits and pieces of, right. of um, affidavits which is always a bit a bit ropey or not ropey but it's certainly a bit hard to report on sometimes when you're trying to you know take notes and making sure you're accurate so hopefully uh, at some point down the line we'll we'll get hold of the affidavits uh, through and official channels more detail and in we them. might get you know we'll filter out more detail then and and get get a we'll probably get a a, a more filled in picture of exactly you know the involvement of of Michael Gately in in, in certain incidents and and his role in the various crime gangs just come back briefly to the aim and the don Dunn murder, which occurred in 2010, at which point that according to this belief evidence that's been put before the court, belief evidence, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But kind of, it, was, it, was part of, it was part of the the chief officer's belief evidence in which he, he referenced other affidavits, which are the, the grounding affidavits. So you'll have one where there be could, there could be two or three, but you certainly have, you'll, you'll have one affidavit by, you know, a, a senior investigating officer who will give a full account of, you know, Mago Gately's involvement in crime, you know, the, it'll literally be the, 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 the life and times of, uh, of, of, of a criminal and mm-hmm. it'll be there and it'll, it'll all be there to show, their, you know, his serious involvement in crime and it'll go way back. It, you know, it might yeah. show, you know, it, it, but none of this was necessarily referred to. I mean, I suppose there was, there was so much, I, I, I suppose, um, good stuff uh, in terms of evidence, you know, from the cab's point of view at the time when this money was being spent on their house in Kulak, which is which the case is actually all about. Mm-hmm. It's all about um, that this little house on on uh, Glynn Avenue, uh, which was basically doubled in size, bought for one hundred and twenty five thousand, and an estimate of four hundred and forty thousand spent on it. So they essentially rebuilt an entirely new house at the back of it, which was variously described as a two story apartment. Is he originally the, from Kulak, or did he move out there? He's in North Inner City, isn't he? I think. I, as far as Inner City, it was always North Inner yeah. City. Um, and and obviously this house was bought. It was in his name, and a plan a planning application went through. I noticed it was um, Philip Sheedy was the architect. Um, what year was that that they bought that house? That that would have been in the spot there. It, that was actually the planning was lodged in 2013. It was it was it was lodged. Sorry, it was bought in 2013. The extension was completed in 2015. Uh, like the building work was done, and then it was kind of uh, it was. It was finished off. It was, you know, outfitted and finished off in, in 2016. So this so was kind was, of like at dates that according to this belief evidence and, and including the time that, that Dunn was shot at the Fossa House when James Mago Gately was part of the Kinahan Organised Crime Group. So it's kind of before all the trouble. Yeah, or, or just, it's kind of overlapping really, isn't it? Mm. Um, you know, when he was finishing off in 2016. So presumably that might have kind of put the kibosh on, on business as usual. We, yes. know, we know that they all struggled to make a bit of money while they were trying to kill each other, that they couldn't do both at the same time, or certainly not as easy. Um, but like, I mean, the, the expenditure before that was, was, was uh, I think the phrase was used, was actually, it was eye-watering. And we heard that in the, the Free Legal Aid application in October 22. Um, and again, it came up this week about the, the three-week cruise to um, the Far East. Um, and I just, I took note of, of some of the places that were mentioned, if I can find it. But it kind of, they basically flew out uh, on Emirates, mm. out to Singapore. Um, they, joined, they joined the ship in Singapore and then uh, took off sort of around, I think they, they got to the Gulf of Thailand, um, they were in Vietnam, they were in Korea and finished off in Japan. So it, it was a three week. It was Bob, it, wouldn't it? Well, it would have. And it was one with a balcony view yeah. as well. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the cabin class or the yeah, economy yeah. class, you know. Um, Very nice. And they had, a, they had a trip with the full t- family in tow, as it was described, uh, to the Caribbean as well the year before. 
So, I mean, they were, they were enjoying um, spending a few quid mm. as well as putting this 440,000 in. And, and they were kind of, kind of showing that they didn't have any money. And there was admissions, that, well, not admissions, but it was an attempt at defence. Um, like Mago Gately was saying, look, there was those credible threats to his life and he hasn't been able to work since 2015 and hasn't been in receipt of any um, uh, social welfare. And so was entirely dependent on, on his partner, Charlene Lamb. And and family members to to tide him over. Um, so I mean, he, he's kind of more or less saying he had no income, but at the same time, her income uh, in, in in that stage was wasn't much. I think at, at, I think her best year she was earning twenty four thousand through the through the company, uh, through through I think her um, her beautician business, mm. uh, and and they were making again. This was made look. I mean, they were saying like, well, she was only to be able to move her wages to this to pay the mortgage to make it look like there is a legitimately funded mortgage. But then what was she living on in the meantime? So they were living on, you know, there was no, there was no normal living expenditures. And they do this calculation to say what, you know, your normal living expenses should be plus with what they find. And they they come up with a half million deficit in their spending. So that, the, you know, there was, there, there was no way of explaining where this came from. And, you know, the, the council, I mean, did, did their best to kind of say, look, well, it was legitimate. You know, they, they got a 10 grand loan to, to, you know, to set them up, I think, in, in initially um, paying for the deposit on the house and stuff like that. And that they'd done all the work himself or his friends had done it for free. And, you know, people had helped them out with uh with, with some of the materials. And yet, we, we at the same time, Cab were able to find... Uh, emails from the architect to builders pricing the job, um, emails back to other members of of the staff, I think, of, of the architect's firm saying that we sent it out to so many builders and so-and-so has priced it up. And so they had all this. So it, it was very, it was a professional job, you know, it was an architect, it was getting priced up by builders. So this wasn't somebody getting his mates to build his yeah. house and doing it on the cheap. And obviously the job was done so professionally if it was that kind of money. Yeah. Yeah. Had money. Isn't it interesting? And we're just seeing a little window by these this this affidavit, which is covering a, a short period of time in the life of of James Mago Gately and Miss Lamb. But it shows the good and the bad. I mean, it shows all they got from. I mean, the the the, the court has been told that he was a member of the Kinnahan Organised Crime Group, which we know to be a you know multi billion now drug cartel shipping drugs into the country, weapons, etc. Um. You know, you got all those fancy holidays. You got to buy your house. You got to build something three times the value of the actual property, probably when your neighbours couldn't hardly afford to change the windows. Um, you the few businesses, you had those fancy cruise holidays. And then it goes dark. And all of a sudden he is, um, you know, he's shot. He's shot sitting in a, a car at the Topaz petrol station on the Clanchock Road in North Dublin. Um you know, we know that an off-duty nurse at the scene tried to treat him and actually, think, saved his life before he got into hospital. Um, he can't work. He's up in Newry and there's an international hitman in the country with his address and with a plan to kill him. You know, all the wealth and the riches kind of goes to shit, doesn't it? When when in the blink of an eye. And I suppose in, in Michael Corleone terms, you know, the mattresses were to the walls like at this stage. So, I mean, it wasn't business as usual. I mean, maybe, you know, we, we saw that with the, the case recently of John Kuhn, like who basically there was nothing left for a cab to find because they just blew it all mm. and just mm. spend, spend, spend. So, you know, I guess there's some guys are, are, are going to be better at, I suppose, figuring out what you really want. What's the point in saving it if a cab are going to come and take it? So we might as well spend it. Good times and then there's bad times, really bad times. I mean, they're not normal bad times. You're getting shot at. You're, you're, you know, your family are at risk. You have to put bullet resistant windows in your house. You have to live offside. You have to, you know, be careful wherever you drive. I mean, there was a tracker on his car that time that he was shot by Caelan Smith, who was on the payroll of the Kinnahans and got 20 years sentence for the hit attempt. Yeah. And and um, even even in, in Newry, like where where he was going to be shot, they had details of the underground car park where he parked. He, he'd been under surveillance as well. Mm. So, I mean, they, they kind of, yeah, I mean, look. It, and of course, I, I guess if you choose that life. Paul Bearer for one of his best friends who was, you know, shot dead. Gary yeah. Hutch, he carried him, he's carried his coffin through Dublin. Um it just is sort of, <laughs> it's a, it's an eye opener really of what it's all about. It's not all about the good times. It's, it's the bad times really, I think, far outweigh surely 
the three well, week. Yeah, I, I, I would entirely agree with you. But um, I mean, I guess it's, some people, it's 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 the price you pay. It's the cost of doing business, and mm. even you know, it's part of the fun to some extent. And uh, that's very much an in inverted commas. But like, I'm sure some of these guys get a, an, an adrenaline rush, like it out of you know wearing a bulletproof vest or having to keep a gun hidden nearby, or you know, and it adds to the drama of their lives, which I guess is fine in your twenties, early thirties. But like, when you start having kids, you know, you're kind of wondering. If you're thinking in a normal frame of, frame of mind, maybe now it's time to slow down. Oh, you know, and and I suppose what Cab is doing is stopping um, people like James Mago Gately or John Kuhn from becoming legitimate. Yeah, that you can't say that one day you stop all this. You know, having been involved in in lethal gangland feuding, you can't suddenly one day turn around and become, you know, you know, own, own your own pet shop sweets. or yep. selling sweets or whatever it is. Mm. You can't just you know step out and enjoy the fruits of your of your your murderous. And do you think career. that's what people are still trying to do? Do you think that's the ultimate aim for people who, when they initially go into it and they kind of go, "I'll just do a little bit of this. I'll make enough money to buy my house." Then I'll make enough money just to do it up. And then I'll make enough money to go on a cruise. And then I'll... Yeah, but, but I mean, you could see it at the very top end. I mean, you could you could see it with Christy Kinnan Sr. want to be an aviation consultant, sort of advising people on, you know, how to, how to live their lives, uh, presumably be a vegan uh, as well as owning a, an, an airline servicing, I don't know, hospitals in Africa or whatever it was, you know. So I mean, yeah, and, and and be able to walk around in in a you know in in a big city like you know Dubai or Hong Kong or whatever, and pretend to be the international businessman, mm. which in one sense he is, but like you know, it's not a normal business. And you know, look, I mean, they're they're sanctioned now. The Americans are after him for for you know lots of various reasons, as far as we understand, everything from you know money laundering for Hezbollah to you know uh, carting uh, you know co cocaine around the world. So I mean. You know, I guess you know Michael Gately is is is, is further down the line, and and whether people like this, you know, want to have a different life, I'm not entirely sure. You see, mm. some guys do, but they do it at the other end. They almost kind of shave their heads and wear a sackcloth and ashes, and come out of prison saying, "I'm never going 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 to you know mm. to do that again." And they don't get involved in the flash side of it because. You know, I mean, all that empty bling to some extent is just that. And, you know, some people get fed up of it. So some people get fed up of it. Some people never do. Um, yeah, this is certainly, I think it's probably addictive, you mm -hmm. know, the spend and that, you know, constant money and, and being able to do that is almost therapeutic to get rid of it. The um, Gately, why is he fighting this case? Surely uh, he shouldn't be wanting this kind of information on the public record about him or does he care? It's hard to know if he cares. I mean, he he never physically turned up at the at the case, nor did um, Charlene Lamb, but they were represented throughout it, and the, the, you know they got limited free legal aid for a forensic accountant and a forensic uh, quantity surveyor um, to kind of challenge you know what the cab were doing. I mean, that actually held up the case. It went on and on uh, for quite some time. They had difficulty getting someone to do it, and then the the judge wasn't happy with the. He, with the price that these um, forensic specialists were going to co cost and he capped it at a certain point on the basis that, well, I could read the file in eight hours, so they're getting eight hours at whatever euro, <laughs> euro an hour. And then the, the, in the case of the quantity surveyor, he came back with almost the exact same figure as the cab's uh, quantity surveyor on how much was spent in the house. So all the, all the you know, the wriggling in the ends and wrangling didn't, you know, it didn't, didn't amount to much. In fact, if anything, it strengthened the cab's case that they came up with, you know, a, a separate quantity surveyor who came up with the same figure. I think there was two grand in the difference. Isn't it interesting that we rarely see sort of hutch associated cases coming before the courts, the Criminal Assets Bureau? Maybe there's just more of them, but there seems to be plenty of bling floating around the Kinnahans, but the hutches, I mean, even members that maybe we can identify and we don't need to name, but they don't have much or look as if they have much. Well, I suppose like Jerry Hutch, the monk himself was, was hip. Bar him. Uh, yeah, no, but, but I, but like, but that was a long time ago in the yeah. early days. And obviously lessons were quite possibly learned. I mean, like Jerry Hutch, we know has properties in outside of this jurisdiction and in Spain. Um, and it's largely in Lanzarote and I, I do imagine in luxury and all the rest of it. But I mean, sort of, Casting him aside, looking at some of the other prominent yeah, no, absolutely, of the yeah, but but I mean, it, it is possible that you know some people have you know taken taken the point mm. and keep their assets outside of this country. And what's and the mean, point if you can't enjoy them? Well, if you enjoy them in the sun in Spain, yeah, you can. I mean, it, it is. 
I mean, to some extent, like we we do know that the like there was a, there was a couple of cases recently. Um, you know, there was apartments that they knew of um, that people were trying to buy in places like Bulgaria, and they're saying, "Look, well, we can't get any any information about it." Place in Turkey, it's much the same. So you know, but you're, you're living in Turkey, you're enjoying your assets there. You know, yeah. Um, and and even in in cases where there's been property in Spain, you can't necessarily force anyone to sell it. You can use it in evidence. Say, look, we know that he or he or she owns this property in Spain, and they couldn't possibly have afforded it, you know, through legitimate means. And um, they can't necessarily f- get in, you know, enroll the Spanish authorities to se- to force them to sell it. Now, I think there is legislation at some point being touted, like that, you know, to to kind of wrap up this loophole that. Uh, certainly within the EU, EU at some point we might see where, you know, corresponding organizations been able to work with each other to seize assets of of criminal figures. I mean, look, we do know, I mean, there was another separate case um, involving the UK police that was mentioned um, and they were very helpful in in helping CAB to seize assets of people here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually, there was two cases. One of them was, um, it was in, involving that firm, uh, Nita Investments, were involved in a huge amount of uh, invoice redirect schemes. And th- th- that was entirely kind of information supplied by the UK police. And there was another one where um, it was kind of a funny one to some extent, unless you're involved yourself, but it was a, uh, a guy who was described by South Wales police as being involved in crime. And he actually gave evidence against his ex-wife to say, yes, it was it was all the proceeds of crime because he didn't want her to get the money. Really? But he'd rather cab that one before. He'd rather cab get it. Well, you will on Sunday. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk <laughs> so, about that one next so, week. Then, so you, you know, so there is that kind of cooperation that goes on. But like, I mean, some of them obviously are, are cute enough. Um, some of them, again, you know, I mean, it, it was something I I, I think. Uh, you know, Joey had spoken to you about before about how some of the guys just live hand to mouth. They're making huge sums of money, and some of them are addicted to drugs. Some into gambling. Some go drinking. Some it's prostitutes or whatever. You yeah. know, and they have nothing left. They haven't got a bean. They'll go into prison if they get caught, and they'll come out and start again. Like mm-hmm. you know, with with whatever with their with their dull money, their two weeks dull money in their pocket. You wonder it. is it because it's not an honest wage that you know it's so easily earned that you can just you just feel like lashing it and you don't have that same sense of value for anything. I'd say so, yeah, and and don't forget, like I mean, you, you see it. It's it's a really clear pattern. I think with fraudsters, you have people who are turning tricks day to day, and they know they're going to get caught, and they don't care, and uh, it just pushes it to the back of their mind. They just it's from one to the next. Then you have others who it's more it's a lifestyle thing. It's a game, mm. um, and and again, you know, if they if they ever sat down and thought about it, they were going to get caught at some point. But they they get the Porsche and the big house, and and then the next step up is is the professional fraudsters who you know by and large are are go undetected. You know, there's very few cases, people who get themselves into into proper, you know, business positions and just rip off the shareholders, their partners or whoever else, steal everything. And and they're, they are fraudsters and they're just far more calculating. And it's the same, I think, with, you know, with, you know, someone involved in selling drugs. You've got people at the bottom who are living from week to week or day to day even. And then you have, you know, people who are who are, enjoy playing the game. And I mean, like, even though the Kinhans are the biggest, they probably fall into that second category. Like, you know, there's, you know, even if they never spend a day in jail, they haven't got away with it. Like the world knows that they're criminals. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, the, you know, Gately and I think others that are attracted to the life as well, you know, I wonder why he's doesn't just sort of roll over and move on and whatever. But they do tend to be, anti-establishment, anti-state and kind of high risk individuals who don't behave, you know, it's not like accountants, etc., who are sort of attracted to the world of high level organised crime. I think Gately did live in Spain for a period of time or certainly was over and back during the height of the Kinahan's power there. So, you know, and he is described in this affidavit as pretty senior member of it and links to the some of the high you know, the, the higher sort of end crime that they would have been uh, involved in. So it could be just a personality as well that that he has that's drawn to it that, you know, you just fight the cab. You're not going to roll over and give them anything. You're just going to fight back. Yeah, I, you see that with a lot of the cases. Some just ignore them completely. Don't go near it. Others like go through the rigmarole of instructing lawyers and do their best to more or less delay things. So they figure you know, if we get another couple of days out of it, uh, you know, or a couple of years or weeks, you know, great. Like we've had the fun of the asset involved, whether mm. it's, you know, whatever it is. I mean, it's uh, especially when it's a family home, 
um, the courts have to, they, they, they have this phrase like, you know, that um, justice has to be served and, you know, the, the interests of justice, you know, have to be carefully watched out for uh, and throwing, a, a you know, a, a innocent members of a family because somebody's involved in crime out of their home is something that Irish courts don't do lightly. Mm. So they have to kind of really go through it. I mean, there was one brief mention of a completely separate case, a much smaller case, um, and it came back up saying like they were looking for what, you know, I think a section four a, a receiver to be appointed and saying that, you know, that this house that was declared the proceeds of crime in 2016 is still being lived in by yeah, that's by a the person time, involved, you know, so they kind of wanted to get a move on, like, you so know. That's free rent, essentially, for six Well, well presumably so. Or, in Dublin. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, this one is actually down on the, in, it's in the west of Ireland. Okay. So it's, it's a separate one again. Like, you know, but it's just an, ex an example of it. Like, you mm. know, well, like, you know, you could have walked away and handed the keys over to the cab. Yeah. But in the meantime, you've got eight years more out of your assets, you know. And yeah. I'm sure there's, there's various um, successful ploys. I mean, you see a lot of people, you know, coming in. And, you have to and, have a certain personality for that, though. No, you, you would do it. Yeah, it is. You want to have, yeah, yeah you want to have that kind of oppositional kind mm -hmm. of uh, personality, as for lack of a different thing, where you give nothing to the state. I mean, and don't forget, like, you know, some of it's rooted in, 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 you know, core reason, like, you know, when you, when you think about like how many people in prison, the surveys done of, you know, they were, they were kind of abused in institutions, like, you know, so, I mean, to them, you know, the guards and the courts and social workers or, you know, the, the cruelty men, as they used to call them in Dublin from the, the, the children's uh, charities, whatever. I mean, as far as they were concerned, you know, all these people, you know, collaborated together to, to make these, you know, to mm -hmm. make your life in misery and not saying everybody who was through that system ended up in crime. But some people who have, you know, have have used that to justify why they hate guards yeah. or why they hate the judges. And they won't judges. cooperate with that. And then, and then their own families then, you know, continue on that tradition. So, I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it's not, it hasn't come out of thin air to some extent. Well, listen, I'm looking forward to hearing about the dodgy divorce and the, yeah, and the guy <laughs> giving the money to Cab. I love that sort of stuff. I think that is, that is the stuff of movies. So uh, we'll talk about that next week. We'll do. No problem, Nicola. Thanks, Eamon. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.